I got a text from a client that said, Hey, I heard this is national RD day. And I just want you to know how special you are to me. And I'm like, Hello, welcome to the Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders. To those of us who have been around for a while, I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. A skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. Hello, and welcome to episode two of the Seasoned RD podcast, where we have Becca McConville. So much fun to interview her. She is an MSRD, LDN, CSSD, so Certified Sports Dietitian, and CEDRD, which is Certified Eating Disorders Registered Dietitian and Supervisor. So she, in addition to her private practice, she served as a consultant to the University of Missouri-Kansas City Athletic Department, the Kansas City Ballet, some local colleges, and previously worked with the Kansas City Chiefs. Becca is also the author of Finding Your Sweet Spot, How to Avoid Red S, which is Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport, by Optimizing Your Energy Balance. And she also conducts the Empower Masterclass for clinicians on Red S. She's the co-host of a podcast called Fit for a Queen, P-H-I-T, devoted to female athletes. In spring of 2020, 2020, cut that. In spring of 2021, she will release her workbook on transitioning out of sport with Dr. Mel Strano. Such an important topic. So we called this From Humble Pie to Authentic Connection. And so the premise of this podcast really is about supervision, about how we learn, about how we train, about how we learn, about how we show up in this field of eating disorders. And Becca's example is a great one for all of us to learn from. So I just want to say thank you so much to Becca for making this interview so fun and for teaching us so many things along the way about your area of expertise. Becca, we are so excited to have you here today for the podcast, The Seasoned RD. It's bringing together newer dietitians in the field with those who have been around for a while. Oh man, I'm in the season category. (laughs) I think so. I think so. Yeah. We're just really excited about your perspective, about how you got into the field. And before we get started with that though, we have a few questions for you. All right. It's either, it's a this or that. Okay. Mountains or beach? Uh, Mountains. Okay. It was a quick answer. You didn't even have to think about it. I'm mountains too. (laughs) I'm a beach girl myself, I think. Okay. Yeah. So your your second question, breakfast or dinner? We can't do Brenner. Oh. (laughs) Do whatever you want to (laughs) do. Brenner it is. Audio book or paper book? Oh, paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is my friend who uses a paper calendar. (laughs) (laughs) I think I'm feeling judgment. No, I have one now. See, right here, look. I'm learning from you. I have one as well. Uh huh. Oh, see, see? <laughs> I started a new trend. For me, never too old to teach an old dog a new trick. Call <laughs> <laughs> me an old dog. And I, an old dog. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to bring you back before we get started. A, a, a long time back to your exam day when you were taking your RD exam. What do you remember from that? Was it a number two pencil or a keyboard? Oh. A little bit of both. You had pencil to help do your math, but you still did the test online. Okay. Oh, I have a funny story on that. (laughs) I happened to be, um, one of my classmates was there taking the test at the same time. And I, in the past, was known to rush through tests because I hated them. But this one was big, right? Like, this is what you've done your whole entire studying career for. And so she gets up and leaves. And I'm like, oh, my God, like 45 minutes later, I'm still taking this test. And so you get to where the screen pops up and it's all these numbers. And you know how you're just so wound up and anxious that I was like, I, I can't tell if I passed. I can't tell if I passed. <laughs> and I-, I go out and like start to almost have a panic attack. And I go to the lady and she's like, are you done, hon? I was like, 
I don't know if I pass. And so she prints it out. She goes, well, I'm not technically supposed to do this. But if you look up in the top in the little small corner, she says it's not very big, but it says congratulations. They <laughs> they should do like balloons. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great story because yeah, I mean, mine was booklets and there was no computer at the time. We had to bring two number two pencils and they had oh. to be both sharpened and we couldn't really get up and we couldn't write in the book, but we had a blank piece of paper we could write on. Maybe you guys, that's the same. And Beth, didn't you have to wait a couple of weeks to get your results? Oh, yeah. Oh, the Absolutely. anxiety. Oh. By mail, snail mail. <laughs> that's, um, that's still how your board specialist is, though. You get that by mail and you have to wait for it. My gosh, I could not even imagine. Yeah. Well, we want to know how you got into the field of eating disorders. I mean, maybe what got you interested in becoming a dietitian, how you got into eating disorders as a field. And, and you're also a certified sports dietitian, right? Like many of them, I didn't, uh, at first I actually will confess. I was like, Oh, I don't want to do that. Like too much intensity, too much emotions. But now that I'm in it, I will never leave it. Started in a lot of like many clinical dietetic routes in which I was in a weight management program. And I confess I was a diet dietitian but now I'm an anti <laughs> and I learned it through watching my, my patients and my clients. This was in a hospital setting that just either a, they started to shift and I felt like they didn't even want to come in to see me anymore. B the look of shame, how at first they would be so excited. And then it would be like head down. Oh, back. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I can't, I can't lose any more weight. And then I realized like, it's not them. It's me. It's something that's going on because for every 20 patients, I'm getting the same thing, but I'm the one dietitian. And so I actually had reached out to a psychologist. We, there was a behavioral health unit at the hospital that I was at and asked them if there was anybody that treated emotional eating and did the emotional component. And that if we were going to start doing surgeries that I wanted them to be part of the team, and met Michelle and Kathy of Insight Counseling. And they came in and they did a, a presentation for our hospital. And I was like, oh, that's it. That is exactly what I see. That is exactly how I want to align as a dietitian. And actually from that point forward, stepped out of the weight management clinic. They had eventually invited me into private practice, but I didn't really feel that confident. I had been working with athletes at that point at various places but jumped into supervision and then just ended up falling in in love with it. I kind of took a windy route to to get there, but I think it was the windy route I needed to go to also empathize with my clients when they sit across from me and they share their stories of maybe not as experienced dietitian. And I say, I was that person and I apologize. We just, we didn't know any better and we're, we're trying to learn better and do better. Yeah. You know, I was sharing with Abby uh, the other day about a patient when I worked on the inpatient eating disorders unit It was my first job in eating disorders in 93. I remember this patient coming in and telling me, she said, I can't tell my outpatient dietitian. She saw a dietitian at a hospital and that she would eat a one pound Hershey bar, but she could tell me because I was an eating disorder dietitian. It was just a different, you know, that shame that you mentioned. And Becca, that's the thing that I think is so cool about you is that you saw the need and you reached out to a psychologist at the hospital and here you are. Well, it helps to have a mom that's a social worker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll share uh, another really cool story that I think was super healing for myself and for the client, but you talk about coming full circle. Well, at one point I worked within a gym and they basically would make every person come in and get like, weight loss, nutrition counseling. And I was never very aggressive or I would like to think I wasn't very shameful, but this one client had lost, I don't even want to give how many pounds. And then fast forward, oh my gosh, it'd be almost six years. And I was at insight counseling. And then she comes on and comes to see me. I was like, oh my God, I saw this person. And I remember sitting and I was like, do you remember seeing me? And she's like, I do now. And I was like, I had no idea you had an eating disorder. And she said, I know I didn't tell anybody. And I was like, 
oh my gosh, if I had known that, I would have been more protective of the things I was asking from you. And look what happened. It ended up being an escalation to eating disorder behavior. So I also am very protective of when dietitians don't screen for that, the harm that we can do. But also, I mean, she ended up breaking down crying and she's like, I so needed to hear that because I thought it was me. I thought it was something I did wrong. And I was like, no, that that's on me. I should have known better and done better. And I apologize. I get goosebumps even when I still remember that. Yeah. Story. I mean, I think about that too. And, and this is one of the reasons for the podcast is that we, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the field. We all can look back and learn from what those kinds of things. And I have them too. I have several that will come out along the way, but that is a, a great example of how you were able to just meet her where she was now and not have that. Oh my gosh, is she going to tell me here's some, and Abby, you and I were talking about like when you're a hospital dietitian, I worked on the cardiopulmonary unit and they would come in for open heart surgery. And I'd come in with my packet of information and they weren't interested in that. They wanted to go home. (laughs) And, but I, you know, had all this great information and I knew what I was going to help them with. And um, that's really ungratifying over time. And so the kind of work we get to do here is really personal. Right. The, the relationships you get to establish with clients, because I think most people don't realize you, when you work with an eating disorder client, it's like two to five years. And I, before my clients panic and be like, Oh my gosh, I mean, it gets spread out every other week, once a month, but today as this is being recorded is national RD day. And I was sharing with Beth at lunch that I got a text from a client that said, Hey, I heard this is national RD day. And I just want you to know how special you are to me. And I'm like, holy smokes. Like you don't have to tell me I'm beautiful. You don't have to give me roses. You can send me texts like that. And that's, that's what (laughs) means a lot to me. So (laughs) it is, it's totally different. The connection I'm tearing up. I know you can't see this because it's, it's recorded, but it is, it's that special connection that we get to have. Right. Yeah. I have only been in counseling for a a few months now, but I even feel the same way. I have these relationships with specific clients and even the small progress that we make is so gratifying. And when they express like, Abby, I did this, like, you know, we finally got here. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, I know I'm in the right field. This is exactly what I needed to hear. And one of my clients specifically, she's like, I need, I need a cheerleader. I don't need a doctor to be poking and telling me this and that. I need a cheerleader. Like, can you just please support me? And I'm like, 100%. I will do whatever (laughs) you need. And I love developing those relationships. Great. Amen. And Abby, you have some questions for Becca. I do. I have several questions. So first of all, I was exploring through your website and your blog and your blog is incredible. As I was going through it, I'm like, oh, this one of my clients would really thrive off of reading this. And oh, one of my clients would really thrive off of reading that. And it was so awesome. So I do have- Well, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one that reads them. No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm planning on sharing them. Absolutely. (laughs) They're they're great. But I do have several questions. So first, I really want to talk about Red S. I think a lot of people still refer to it as the the female athlete triad. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to learn a little bit more about Red S. Sure. So Red S is relative energy deficit in sport. And so that's kind of a mouthful for basically, and we don't want to just say athletes, active individuals who have expended so much energy that they do not have enough energy left to pay their day-to-day bills. And by that, I mean digestion, neurotransmitters for their brain to get nice, deep sleep, their, their heart vessels to be strong and be able to pump adequate blood flow. You can have acute, which means that we can actually see changes hormonally and functionally within five days. And when we talk about energy deficit, it doesn't have to be significant. It can be 250 calories worth or 300 within five day window that the body wants to shut down and start conserving energy. Then we look long-term and that's where, and I'm so glad that they moved out of the triad because to me at that point, they probably have been in an energy deficit for almost six months to get to that point that we have stress fractures, weight changes, et cetera. The other part is like so many things that we have weight stigma it has nothing to do with weight. A lot of my clients and athletes actually come in 
originally for Becca, there's, there's something wrong with me. I can't lose any weight and I'm restricting and I'm exercising so much like, well, yeah, your metabolism has dimmed all the lights as low as it can go to conserve energy. And this is a metabolic compensation to save and protect you right now. But we are in a diet ridden culture that seems to love to try to figure out ways that we can underfuel athletes. And I can't wait for the day that we're like, what is the downside of being fueled? I guess another question branching off of that is how exactly did you get into the world of sports nutrition and how did you get certified in that? Well, being a college athlete, as every level goes up that it gets more competitive, you're kind of looking for that competitive advantage. I have no idea even how that got planted in my head because originally my degree was in biology and I thought, hmm, what if I started playing around with what I'm eating? Maybe I'll get faster. Maybe I'll, I'll get quicker on the court and just started experimenting and then got hooked. I was like, wow, I am faster. Wow. My coach is commenting about how much stronger I'm getting in the, the weight room, but even though Kansas city is a bigger area, there really is not a whole lot of huge opportunities for, for sports nutrition, unless you're going to either Columbia or KU. And I was, my dietetics was my second degree and I was married at that point. So it would have been some long commuting. So I had to slowly build up with consulting roles Mm -hmm. and then finally got to where I was able to have more in a private practice. So Similar to like the CEDRD, you have to have enough specialty hours counseling within sports nutrition, CEUs, et cetera, and then you can apply to sit for your your boards. Okay. Do you feel like now with all of the expertise and knowledge that you have, not only in eating disorders, but also in sports nutrition, do you ever think back to when you were an athlete and can you pinpoint like, oh, this teammate probably had something going on or why was I not aware of this? Oh, that, that was me. I mean, that's how I got into reds because I was missed so often for very subtle things. And I just thought I was being a driven athlete trying to secure my, my starting position. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. denied being able to donate blood because I was anemic. I had an injury that wasn't healing. I was in and out all the time for irritable bowel syndromes. I mean, I could go on and on with all the flags that should have came up that never did. Um, I was put on birth control for my sporadic periods, <laughs> but that's only because they're doing little snapshots at one time. And actually to my teammates credit, they were the ones that called me out because they're like, Becca, you just don't seem like yourself. Like you don't want to go out to this party. You don't want to go hang out with us. And it was because I was so tired and fatigued. Mm -hmm. So I think from that, I now want to protect my athletes from going through that, from having that disconnect from their, their teammates and their team and be able to let them have a fruitful college, high school, whatever experience they're, they're wanting. Yeah, that's, I actually had a really similar situation myself. So I played soccer in college and before going in, I was prepping, you know, wanting to be top of my game. I'm a collegiate athlete now. And I thought in my mind, let's get, let's run as much as we can. Let's eat as little as we can. And I became a terrible athlete. I was awful. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody really noticed because I was new to the school. And so nobody knew what I was like beforehand, but I kind of, just woke myself up and realized like, I'm really hurting myself and I have to wake up out of this. And so finally I did, but it's so interesting to hear your perspective. And I'm sure that that can help so many of your clients knowing that you went through something similar. They can really relate to you through that. Sure. And I also understand how people get overlooked Mm -hmm. very easily And it's not just the coach. None of my coaches endorsed or pushed this on me. They just set certain bars high from like a fitness standpoint. And I'm, I'm going to go above and beyond that to impress my coach. So of course, when I did that, they were like, wow, you work so hard, but they should have noticed like something was off, but there, there wasn't any direct pressure on weight or anything else. Do you ever work with coaches on nutrition and what they should be aware of? I would like to have more when I have an athlete, if they have asked for their coach to be included in their care, I bring them into the team and I actually have direct communication one, especially when guiding return back to activity 
but also being like, you know, I would like to get your feedback on what you're seeing at practice because indirectly, I think that helps teach the coach what to look for, what not mm-hmm. to say, what to say, and when to make sure they're guiding them to support. And I think coaches want to do better. I think there's been so much pressure on them that they're to blame. Now there are things like Alberta Salzar and Mary Kane that come to mind, but I, I do feel like for the most part, they, they, they love their athletes and they want to do right. Mm -hmm. That's something that I'm learning too, as I grow in this field is that it's a team approach. You know, there needs to be multiple people involved to help that individual. So it's Mm -hmm. great to hear that coaches are involved. They've never even considered that before. Mm -hmm. If productive, if an athlete expresses, they do not want their coach involved. Technically they are not included under the HIPAA umbrella. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to, if they have said they want them to be a support person, by all means. I mean, that's almost like a parent when you go to college. So we want any and everybody that can help them be as a part of the team with their own roles. Mm -hmm. That's great. Your conversation is really just inspiring me right here because both of you have experiences in the sports world and we are going to have a therapist on to talk about transference, counter-transference. So things that maybe happen to you that we might think are when we're working with our client has happened to them, but we're not sure how it's impacting us. But when you said, Abby, that I want to share some of Becca's blogs with one of your clients, you're, you're going to tap into that a lot more than someone who hasn't had the experience that you've had and pull that it's going to be like gold to you. And to me, that's the nuggets of the things that we get to share across experience levels is you're going to share that with them. And then Becca's a supervisor also. So she supervises those newer RDs who are coming into the field of sports dietetics. And, and they're realizing just like we all did in our, you know, outpatient hospital (laughs) that we are treating people with eating disorders. We just haven't asked the right questions. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, not to not to talk about specifically the background of this podcast so much, but really highlights how unique this is, because there's going to be so many other newer RDs that don't know about your awesome blog, Rebecca. And so now that now they know and they they might be able to relate to. And so just really sharing all this great knowledge we all have. Well, and you guys bring up a good point when you have had a personal connection to disorder eating disorder, reds, that is why supervision is critical. Cause while I was in a better place, there were still things that were very subtle that I did not realize were still probably a little disordered in nature. I love my supervisor and she would gently call me out on it. And then I would get in the car that night and drive home and realize, Ooh, I'm kind of eating some humble pie. And so it's helpful because you don't want some of the things that you have normalized that could be disordered to end up being normalized for your clients. So it was really nice to be able to be like, there's some things I need to address for myself before I start targeting and working on this with my, my clients. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of supervision, how did you get into it? To be honest at first, because I had to (laughs) know, but it's kind of funny. I share this all the time when I have dietitians reach out and they're like, oh, but do I need supervision? And I'm like, yes, you do. But when I, I joined Insight Counseling, that was a prerequisite because they wanted to be that when anybody was coming in, they knew that the dietitians and therapists that were there were adequately trained. And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'm going to be brutal. I'll do this to get the referrals. As I dug into supervision, I don't know how people try to do this work without because you are dealing with such heavy dynamics, volatile people that you start to love and want to take care of. And so you you want to make sure that you're doing right for them. You want to also make sure you have that sounding board to be able to make sure that you, there's not different approaches that you can do in learning how to involve those team members. Like now when I have a new therapist, I always reach out to them and be like, how do you like to coordinate care? How do you like to team and work the nutrition and therapy together? So I can learn to sync what I'm doing with that therapist so that that client can get the best care and making sure that that line of communication from the get-go is immediately open. Something else I noticed off of your blog, um, you talked about your most recent one for National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. You talked specifically about how sometimes the brain gets into this fight or flight mode and how it creates this anxiety and different people react 
uniquely to that form of anxiety in their brain. And I would love for you to highlight that relating to eating disorders. Oh, sure. And that's one of the things I was listening to a a podcast this morning and they're like, you you have to understand that that is the most primal protective nature. And a lot of times we start to be able to understand our mental health better when we know how the brain works. So even just basics of how the brain works, our brain is constantly scanning for things to assess as danger. And when we have a culture that is nonstop focused on food, weight, your amount of movement, it's going to pick that up as a danger. If you're not aligning with the messages that are given, then you start to hyper-focus and fixate on that. Well, when you are pulled into fight or flight, you don't have an action plan because you're stuck there. And do I run? Do I stay? When I work with clients, I really start to educate them on knowing the difference between when their brains are processing in that fight or flight, or if they're in a more comfortable probably going to have, but I always have them watch the Dr. Laura Hill Ted talk where she's like trying to make a decision with 10 white noise machines going on at the same time is like next to impossible. How do we get to that place where we can think through more rationally and cognitively and not be in this state of anxiety? It's funny that you mentioned that TED talk because that's exactly what I was thinking about when I was reading through your blog post is like, they must be hearing that static noise. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So Becca, how do you feel that sports dietitians are prepared for eating disorders? I mean, you yourself and then the people who reach out to you for supervision or it's a tough question because I, I would not have said I was prepared for it. I mean, I stumbled into it in my role as a sports dietitian and then I'm an adamant researcher. So I started trying to learn more about it and kind of go from there. I think a lot of it depends too on their experience as an intern, what kind of education they try to take on. But it's while the test has a focus on it, it is not a prerequisite in learning and definitely not in like the therapy and modalities around eating disorders. So there are organizations, I'll go ahead and give a shout out to like the CPSDA, which is now um, we're talking about doing a panel on supervision. So I think they're, they're trying to get these opportunities. We're just not there. And when you look specifically at the world of sport, if we have statistics that say 65% of certain sports have an incidence of eating disorders or disordered eating, then we have to have sports dietitians who are also duly certified and experts in eating disorders with that much overlap. Mm-hmm. Oh, so great. <laughs> I also want to ask you, because when Abby was asking you about coaches, you were also talking about bringing in, you know, the therapist and the, how do you do that? Is that important to, to have other team members? Oh, absolutely. Well, one, I mean, I'm always teaming with the therapist because <laughs> eating disorders are emotional beings, right? That's, that's a part of it. So in a university setting, it, it more than likely is going to be their athletic trainer. That's kind of their me- medical liaison in between sports med, the therapist, and then they are wanting parental involvement. We'll bring the, the parents in. If there is a, a teammate that they would like for support at meals to an extent, we don't want to put a lot of stressors on those teammates. Each case is unique, but I think going above and beyond with communication is important just so everybody's on the same page and we're not getting, because again, going back to that anxiety piece, if you start getting conflicting messages, immediately the brain goes, uh-oh, something's not aligning, danger, danger, where can I get reaffirming messages and where do we go? Google. <laughs> Google. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Google. Dr. Google. <laughs> yeah. It's so awesome because then also we sometimes need the medical doctor, right? right. Oh, yeah. And we need their clearance for um, their sport or just for outpatient care in general. I agree with Becca that we just don't treat sometimes people with disordered eating and eating disorders will come to the dietitian first. All I need is a good meal plan. <laughs> it is F actually just not even ethical for us to treat them. I will tell people, I can't see you unless you have an appointment with a therapist. Here's some good therapist names. I mean, I may see you one more time, but I can't see you the third time, the second, third time. So kind of putting your foot down for that, because it is first and foremost, a mental mental illness with some very high risks. And thankfully, oh, go ahead. One thing I really want to add to this that I've seen is 
many times either a part of the athletic staff or the athlete is hesitant to jump into therapy because they think immediately it means they're not doing their sport. And, you know, going along the lines of what Ron Thompson or Roberta Sherman, sometimes that sport is therapeutic for them. So as long as they're medically able and it's not ending up feeding into the eating disorder, we want to do everything we can to keep them within the sport, because that also means all those protective eyes. Like I said, my teammates that were calling me out, their coaches that are there, if they're in a bigger setting, they've got all these help staff that get to know these athletes because they see them every single day. Yeah. And thankfully, this is just another example of how far we've come. Back when I first started in the field in the early 90s, we were pulling athletes, Olympic athletes, and saying, sorry, you just can't play your sport anymore, and pulling um, adolescents and teens from their parents and, and trying to empower them because their parents were, quote, too controlling, quote. And now we know that parents can be the best allies, and we know that the athlete and the sport can be therapeutic for them. Absolutely. Back to what you mentioned about the athletic trainers being involved or being that liaison a little bit. Is there any sort of education or background information out there for them to get to know a little bit more about eating disorders specifically within sports? Oh boy, Abby, you just opened Pandora's box. So So there is a toolkit through the NCAA, but they would have to read it. And again, it's like a pamphlet that you read I have actually one. I'm 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 saying this, and I hope somebody hears it. I'm really sorely disappointed in their position statement that they have on eating disorders within NATO, which is the Athletic Training Association. They don't even include binge eating in there. And I have actually talked to them like you. You miss the largest subgroup of eating disorder and treatment. That probably means nobody is addressing or screening that within college sector. I would love just as they have concussion training that's mandated, there needs to be a mandate for eating disorder training at some point. Mm -hmm. They're just as risky. They're just as much medical complications and they see them just as much, if not more than concussions. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I feel like just spreading the word a little bit more, giving more and more professionals the access and the knowledge to this, whether it's a conversation or a podcast or a handout, whatever that might be. But the more that we can inform people, you know, like the better off we will all be. Right. Mm -hmm. You bet. I love it. And this is a great segue into all of the things that Becca's got her hands in and working on (laughs) that we would love to Uh, let you tell us a little bit about what you have to help people, professionals who are treating people with eating disorders. Sure. I would love for everybody at some point, I have a um, course for clinicians on REDS. It's eight weeks and it covers the gamut from the beginning is screening and awareness to the science. We really get heavy and nitty gritty into the science. And then we start talking more about the, the therapy role and then preventative measures that one will be offered a couple times a year. I have now individual supervision and then we'll be starting my first supervision group in April. So hopefully we'll start to, to market that. And then I have my book, that's an easy read. That's meant for the athlete and parent called finding your sweet spot, how to avoid reds as well. And then last but not least coming up to hopefully be published in the next month is with Dr. Mel Strano at last, which is a workbook that's meant to be in the therapy realm for athletes transitioning out of sport, because we also know that that's a huge risk factor for eating disorder relapse or diagnosis. Awesome. Who's in your professional class? Who's that geared towards? Oh, I have, it's the whole team that we talked about. So I have had physical therapists. So I should put that sometimes I loop them in, especially if I'm getting an athlete with like stress fractures or anything else, running coaches, therapists, obviously registered dietitians. I think that's the the main ones for, for right now. I'd love to have more like strength coaches in there, but it was nice this time. Oh, researcher. I also now have a, a researcher in my group that was wanting to make sure that some of their research outcomes weren't skewed by low energy availability. Yeah. So that is very comprehensive and a good, um, I mean, just literally, we are so happy to have you here. So happy to have you advocating 
for for athletes or anyone in sport or anyone who's just loves to be active. And with the certified sports dietitian, as well as the certified eating disorders, registered dietitian, and now supervisor, we are really looking forward to having your influence spread in lots of different places. So one question to wrap it up. Unless Abby, you have any (laughs) other questions. No, but I, this was awesome. I love learning from you, Rebecca. This was Aww, really, really yeah. great. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited for this last question. Beth's going to ask you. It's a good one. <laughs> so thinking back to when you first entered the field of eating disorders, what do you wish you would have known then that you know now? Oh, <laughs> Is there any- I'll share the story I told you today. Where we're okay. Talking- okay. So I had been in private practice at this point about five to six months. And like many, when you make that leap, you you tend to also have like side jobs, side hustles, as we call them. One of the therapists had came into the break rooms like, Hey, Becca, how are you doing? I'm sure you're full by now. And I look at her, I was like, no, I'm not. And I I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You know, I feel like I'm retaining my clients and She's like, well, how many do you have? I was like, I have like 15 hours, but how do you guys get up to 40? And she looks at me and she's like, Becca, that is full. That's a full (laughs) caseload. I'm like, what? I was like, nobody told me that. I'm used to 40 hour a week job. So I assume that 40 hours of clients is what you're supposed to be doing. And then when she told me that it was just like, (laughs) like the way went off me. So as a supervisor, that's one of the things we talk about is the self-care role, your ability to maintain cognitive (laughs) and emotional health in this realm and finding what that caseload is. And not only that, but caseload acuity that you can best serve your clients. So that was probably my, my funniest moment now, but at that moment I, I had been beating myself up, couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. But nothing was wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I first learned that. Based on the therapy model, I mean, full time is not 40 hours a week, but our, as dietitians in the hospital, there's so many productivity comparisons between whether you work in the renal area, whether you work in outpatient or whether you work in whatever. And there's a lot of metrics that they use. And so we have been used to comparing ourselves to that. But in the therapeutic world, as you mentioned, we have to surround each other. I would not have been in this field as long as I have been without this support of others and and them reminding me to do that self-care and and me reminding them and us getting together and hashing out cases together that is the best part of supervision in my opinion is to really just have that that back and forth on a particular case it's not something that they taught you about person a and that this is what's going to come up so it's really really rich Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethharrell.com slash professionals.